um, apologies for the delay here. I just wanted to check before we start, um, is David to Cosmo on the line? Uh, just, I'm sorry, we, we just have uh, some technical difficulties here. We're just still waiting for David. So I'm gonna give him a, a minute or two here. Thank you to get started. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to today's webinar, Agnes at 50. Um, learn from the past, prepare for the future. My name is Kasha Fertala. I'm with the Recovery Operations Branch at FEMA Region 3, um, and I'll be your moderator today. But before I get started, I did wanna mention that today's presentation will be recorded. So thank you for joining us as we remember um, the 50th anniversary of Hurricane Agnes. At the time, uh, 50 years ago in late June, 1972, Agnes became the most expensive tropical system um, in US history and would hold that record for more than a decade. Um, so as a nation, we really learned a lot of lessons from Agnes. And one of those lessons um, was recognizing the need for a better organized and more formal emergency management system at the federal level and the severity of Agnes and the impacts of Agnes um, would spur discussions about creating a federal organization that would eventually become the Federal Emergency Management Agency or FEMA as we know it today um, in 1979. Um, before I turn it over to our panelists today, I wanted to just also plug um, uh, the Silver Jackets website and I can drop the link in the chat um, here in a second, but I wanted to encourage everybody to take a look at that if you haven't yet, um, the Silver Jackets of Maryland, uh, New York, Pennsylvania, and Virginia um, have all uh, co collaborated with local state and federal partners to set up a very comprehensive website to commemorate the 50th anniversary of Agnes. So I'll put that in the chat here in just a second. But without further ado, I wanted to introduce today's panelists. Um, before I do that, uh, David, can you hear us? I know that you're on the dial in right now. If you just wanna unmute. Um, okay, I'll, I'll just keep going. Um, our panelists include my colleague, Mike Builder, uh, FEMA Region 3's Hurricane Program Manager and Mr. David DeCosmo, a retired television journalist, and at the time of Hurricane Agnes, the Luzerne County, Pennsylvania Civil Defense Public Information Officer. So we're really excited to hear about um, uh, David's firsthand account of, of Agnes 50 years ago. Um, and we will have time at the end of the discussion for question and answers, but um, I'll also be monitoring the chat uh, throughout the, the discussion. So, um, so feel free to put your questions in there and we can get to those at the end of, at the, end of the presentation today. So um, I will turn it over to Mike uh, to go over the really impacts of Agnes over the um, 50 years ago. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Kasha. And my ultimate goal, my goal here today is to get, do a very short summary of Agnes because I wanna make sure we maximize the time you all have with David DeCosmo who, uh, it, quite frankly, is, is a hero, um, and his broadcast saved thousands of lives. And, and we as today's emergency managers and even today's citizens can learn a lot from Dave. So without further ado, I'm just going to try to get through. We still got to talk about Agnes, you know, make sure people kind of understand what Agnes was. Some people might be might be tuning in and not quite sure what we're, what we're talking about. So um, I just want to confirm that you can actually see my screen. I should say lead up to Agnes. Yes, Mike, we can, I can see it and hear you. Well, thank you. Ex excellent. And again, I'm going to be, I'm going to be going through this fairly quickly. One of the things you have to know, uh, and, and what we do with hurricanes today is what happens before any sort of, tr any sort of storm comes in, whether it be tropical or non-tropical, is what is the situation like on the ground? What are the ground conditions? Are they, are the stream flows uh, elevated or the, is the ground saturated? Because a lot of that plays in a big role to when the big storm comes in. And sure enough, um, in the lead up to Agnes, there were um, uh, not great what we call antecedent conditions or the ground conditions where we had a lot of rain and, and we had above average precipitation in May. Uh, then we in, in the early half of June of 1972, we also had a, a, a several rounds of rain, even as Agnes was making landfall, we're having additional rounds of rainfall going through the region, which uh, basically set the ball for Agnes to spike. So this was a textbook example uh, of uh, bad antecedent conditions, we like to call them. So the early stage of Agnes, uh, Agnes formed off as a uh, as a tropical storm, uh, eventually attained tropical storm strength off the Yucatan Peninsula on June 16th, and then 
attained a category one strength on June 18th and then made landfall uh, near Mexico Beach, Florida on June 19th as a category one. Uh, as history will have it, uh, it made landfall about five miles away from where Hurricane Michael made landfall in 2018. And so you had a cat five with catastrophic results, and then you had a cat one with catastrophic results. Just keep that in mind when we, uh, and, and to uh, remember that uh, there's no such thing as just a cat one. Uh, we could have different, you know, different types of impacts and, and some of them can be quite severe and catastrophic, um, even if it's a cat one or even a cat two or even a tropical storm. So just to kind of show you how the how things progressed from there uh, became a tropical depression as it crossed over the interior uh, interior southeast and then re, re intensified into a tropical storm when it hit the Atlantic and then uh, basically made landfall again near Long Island. One thing to note you can't see on this map is that there was a frontal interaction and it started um, a lot of interaction with the non tropical front and which actually uh, created another low that stocked. Agnes, and eventually when Agnes came um, ashore again, uh, this uh, tropical or this non-tropical low absorbed Agnes and became this gigantic storm that stalled over the Northeast. So you can see this is when Agnes is after the second landfall and, and it, the two systems merged and it was, uh, but the thing is it was disaster, but there's actually disaster occurring prior to that moment too. So keep that in mind. Looking at the rainfall totals overall, uh, quite a bit of rainfall, especially along the Appalachian Mountains is something we see a lot with these type of storms is the interaction with the, the mountain ranges and the fact that it does, you know, that that uh, upward motion of the air does create uh, uh, additional rainfall and then the violent, or then the steep hills and whatnot creates uh, violent nature of flooding as well. And it all drains down to the big river basins. So the little dots you see here, these purple dots, um, these are uh, indicate where we saw major stage flooding during Agnes, as you can see, this is uh, this is quite a story uh, as far as looking at it from a whole region. This is um, I don't want to say it's unprecedented because we have had some floods even worse than this in our history, but definitely in the last uh, 50 years or so, or you know, 50 years exactly, this is a, this is the worst we've seen it uh, in our part of the country. Now, one thing I want to also note is not only you know you see all the purple dots, but let's put some context there as far as the the areas that were getting hit simultaneously, the big population centers and metro areas. We had Roanoke, Lynchburg, Richmond, Washington, Baltimore, Frederick, Harrisburg, York, Wilmington, Philadelphia, Reading, Allentown, the Jersey suburbs in New York City, Wilkes-Barre, where we're going to focus primarily today, Williamsport, Elmira, Syracuse, Rochester, Buffalo, Pittsburgh, Wheeling, and Morgantown. I like to say, if we had a week uh, in my job where we, this is what we track all the time, if we had if, if we had a fifth of this happen in a given week, it'd be a nightmare. So times that by five, and that's what we had during Agnes. This was uh, incredibly chaotic, uh, and and just the the population impact was huge. And where does Agnes stand today, fifty years later? The red dots indicate where Agnes is still number one on the books for that gauge location, and that is an impressive uh, rain you can see Agnes still has over this part of the country. And then blue is where it's still second highest in the, and the black is where it's third, fourth, or fifth. In our part of the country, we have a lot of flooding. Even if you're just in you know, second through fifth, that's still pretty impressive. So overall uh, impacts, 121, 128 fatalities, uh, 362,000 people had to be evacuated, which is huge for an inland evacuation. Uh, 50,000 homes destroyed or severely damaged and an additional 65,000 that were uh, had at least a minor damage. And on top of that, 8,000 small businesses and farms destroyed or severely damaged. 43 million tons of debris required removal. Extensive damage to bridges, roads, railroads. About 4,000 miles of waterway channels had to be uh, restored. Extreme soil erosion and you know sedimentation and the pollution from the runoff had major impacts on farmland as well as the Chesapeake Bay. And as, as Kasha mentioned before, this was the costliest tropical cyclone in American history up to that point, and it held that distinction uh, for 11 years. And again, just real quick, some of the cities to show you some pictures there, there's Richmond, Virginia and other parts of Central and West Virginia. The DC Baltimore metros, South, Southeastern Pennsylvania and clean Philadelphia got hit. Harrisburg, Pennsylvania and other parts of South Central Pennsylvania, North Central Pennsylvania, where I, where I hail from. Upstate New York, it was pretty bad. And there's a picture here of Corning. And then Pittsburgh, even Western Pennsylvania wasn't spared, um, although some of the mitigation projects did help uh, keep things 
uh, a little bit tamer there than other parts of the region. And finally, the ground zero of ground zero is Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania. And that is where we're gonna talk about today. I think this is a good moment to bring in Dave DeCosmo again, um, and he's gonna tell you his story. Now let's, uh, let's check to see if, if Dave now has audio connection. David, uh, we're ready for you. If you could unmute. Might have to do double unmute, like star six. Don't worry, I have like three hours worth of material we can stall with. <laughs> so we need a couple more minutes for David. I can definitely uh, show you some additional stuff. So maybe Kasha, if you, uh, maybe if you try to give him a, a call or a message real quick. Yeah, no, we we see um, we see David's phone on the on the line here, so we know he's on. Uh, just figuring out the mute situation, so please bear with us. Thank you. Just to kind of tee it up for, for Dave, and he'll talk more about his story here in a moment. Here's some pictures of Dave we have. Um, these are actually taken shortly after he, uh, after Agnes, the civil defense, which was the predecessor, you know, to, to emergency management back then. So Nash Federal Civil Defense came in and uh, actually had him reenact, uh, a lot of the, the command center staff reenact the scenes and the, and the work that they did just a couple weeks prior. So. Uh, these are, uh, this is Dave back in 1972, and, uh, um, and this is General Townen, who was the, he was a retired general who was the, the, basically, he was a civil defense director, but, you know, what would be today be the emergency management director of Luzerne County. Um, and uh, a lot of uh, very important decisions were made in these rooms that you see, you know, Dave at right now. And over here is the Luzerne County Courthouse up there in beautiful Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania. Uh, which is right next to the Susquehanna River, and which will play a role in the story. During the course of this, uh, when Dave gets on, I'm going to try to be quietly uh, presenting some some photos uh, behind him. And he doesn't have a presentation, but we still want it added. So uh, you'll see me add some photos up there as the uh, as the as the uh, his talk goes on. And Dave, I want to check to make sure your cell phone itself isn't muted. For those who don't know much about Wilkes-Barre, it's just south of Scranton. Um, Scranton itself is not on the Susquehanna River, um, but Wilkes-Barre and Scranton are kind of considered part of the same metro area. Scranton, of course, from the uh, office fame, for those who aren't familiar with Pennsylvania geography, uh, but uh, Wilkes-Barre is just south of there. It's, uh, it was a, a very vibrant community at the time, and it's, it has come back quite a bit since Agnes, um, but uh, we kind of call that whole part of the, the area the Wyoming Valley. Uh, so if you ever hear folks talk about the Wyoming Valley, that's what they're that's what they're talking about. Um, as you can see here, Wilkes-Barre, again, I kind of call it the ground zero of ground zeros. And and it really was the hardest hit. The vast majority of, for instance, uh, the housing and urban development uh, trailers uh, for the survivors, folks who need to do homes, vast majority of them were sent to this part of the this part of the region.
big thing that David's going to talk about too is the building of the sandbag wall. They had to get they they thought there might be a chance for them to to save the day, and so they got a bunch of volunteers. I think they called for ten thousand volunteers or something like that, and they got a lot of them. And it really they were desperately trying to raise the the height of that levee during during the uh, you know in the in the advance of the flooding, and they su were successful in getting the levee. Uh, X number of feet higher over the I think over the over six miles or so in six hour it was kind of amazing what they were able to do um, it, but alas it was it was you know the 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 fight was lost and Dave will talk about a little, a little bit more about that um, but it really they did deserve a lot of um, a lot of credit in fact uh, let me see if I can uh, um, while we're getting Dave uh, and another quick sound check on Dave see if we can get him. One thing I, I always thought was kind of funny, um, a lot of the papers afterwards were, were saying, but, you know, again, this is the Vietnam War, it was, it was, a, it was a divisive time. Um, and they, uh, what was, I thought pretty cool looking back at the research where they kept a lot of praise in these, you know, these, these establishment type papers up there and they were praising the hippies. <laughs> they were like, uh, and now to be clear, uh, not everybody who you know partook in the sandbagging would probably appreciate being called a hippie today. So I think that was just their generic term for young people with longer hair. Uh, I want to give a shout out to Jeff Jumper, state meteorologist from Pima. His dad was a sandbagger. Um, I'm not sure if he was a hippie or not, but anyhow. Uh, but basically, uh, there was. I thought this was very heartwarming, and I remember Dave DeCosmo during um, parts of his broadcast. You know the the. This, the the emergency managers were telling you know thank thank the young people thank the young people because the young people were the vast majority of the sandbaggers and they really did try to save the day they stepped up uh, when they were most needed and um, but I always I always thought uh, you know these were these kind of heartwarming tributes you saw in the papers back then. Any luck, Kasha? Um, a couple more minutes, Mike. Sorry, we're just trying oh, to you're good. sign in again here. One thing we may uh, probably won't get a chance to talk about the evacuation centers up there in Wilkes-Barre. Uh, emergency management had to get very creative back then. Uh, they had a lot of evacuees they had to get to... Uh, uh, you know, either house them in the immediate term, you know, shelter them. Uh, they had to also have air operations was key during Agnes because of the massive infrastructure impacts, widespread how you know, people were saying it looked like Vietnam for, for a, a few weeks there in summer of 1972, given just the number of helicopters going around. So folks up in the, uh, who are from the Wilkes-Barre who might be tuning in will recognize some of these places, you know, Pocono Downs, which is a, a racetrack casino. Now today it's Mohegan Sun. They had a that's an evacuation center they set up there on the racetrack. Uh, the Scranton Wilkesboro Airport was where they're uh, bringing evacuees in as well. And College Miscordia is another spot. Um, in fact, um, with College Miscordia, here I'll show you a couple interesting things from there. Um, ended up be, being turned into a makeshift hospital. And uh, they, because uh, there were a lot of interesting stories from the hospital evacuations from, from Agnes. Um, just trying to pull up another couple of slides here. Uh, so basically, you have a here's a slide, or here's a some hospitals in Wilkesburg. One of the hospitals in Wilkesburg, Pennsylvania, had to be evacuated, but that wasn't the only one. There were multiple. Um, there are some interesting stories. I saw some of you know the the folks you know who a woman who just had a, a child just hours before they're handing her 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 newborn and says, "Okay, hey, you, you need to get out of here." And her husband, she couldn't find her husband. Her husband was, you know, there was a lot of yelling and screaming and the lights flickering and everything like that. A very dramatic story. Finally found her husband. They got in a car and they got over uh, the bridge to the river um, or across the river. And they were like one of the last cars to get across that bridge before they shut it down. And I believe that was one of the bridges that did get impacted. So um, there is a, this is a story that, you know, they ended up having to use hearses as, 
as uh, ambulances because they had to evacuate that many, they didn't have enough ambulances to evacuate that many people, uh, patients. So they had to turn to the, the private sector to get assistance, which is, uh, I think, a, a very interesting whole of community story from Agnes. This is College Miscordia. This is what wasn't a hospital before this, um, but this is what it looked like as a makeshift hospital. In fact, there were 26 flood babies that were born at the college. Uh, 1988, they brought them all back together uh, for a for a for a sweet 16. Uh, but this is uh, you know some interesting stories. And it wasn't we you know you weren't seeing this type of things just at the college. They were all over the place. So. Sounds like we might have Dave. David, I think we hear you. Okay, can you see me as well? Don't David? see you, but I think as long as we can hear you, that's great because Mike has all your uh, a lot of images here. So, okay, I I am I am listening, uh, and uh, oh, wait a second, there's another prompt here that may work. There you go, David. We see you. Aha. Uh, technology is such a wonderful thing. I wish I understood how it worked. Great. Well, let me, um, Mike, are you all set? Okay, great. I'm just going to reintroduce um, Mr. David DeCosmo. David is a retired television journalist and at the time of Hurricane Agnes was the Luzerne County um, Civil Defense Public Information Officer. So really excited to have David here today to give us a firsthand account about you know, your experiences and some lessons learned from Agnes. So David, I will turn it over to you. All right, well, I thank you very much and I welcome everybody and I apologize for uh, my own uh, technological uh, insecurity. Apparently what I accomplished in 1972 in terms of communication uh, is not quite as, uh, as good as it ought to be for uh, 2022. In any case, uh, my involvement with Agnes really started sort of accidentally. Uh, our station, WILK Radio, was the emergency broadcast station for Northeastern Pennsylvania. And uh, as the threat of a flood became uh, evident, I decided it would be far better to go to the Luzerne County Courthouse and use our two-way radio to broadcast reports back to our station and our listeners, rather than constantly calling the civil defense officials and interrupting uh, their day. Uh, my boss okayed that, and I went to the courthouse only to find that the one thing civil defense did not have uh, during this particular emergency was a public information officer. And uh, General uh, Frank Townden, who was uh, commanding civil defense, uh, asked whether or not I would take that job. In fact, he said, David, I need you. So uh, I checked with my boss. Uh, Roy Morgan was the owner of WILK Radio and a very community-minded uh, individual who said, absolutely, even though uh, when you think about it, uh, my doing that uh, would be uh, a kind of putting me out of the office and uh, sort of uh, in a position where I'd have to just make all of the decisions myself. Now, one of the first things that happened in terms of getting emergency information out to the public happened thanks to uh, a gentleman who got me into radio, Ron Gilonardo. He went by the name Ron J on WAZL radio in Hazleton, Pennsylvania. And Ron, realizing that an emergency was looming, suggested that if he had permission from WILK, he would pick up our signal and rebroadcast it on WAZL. That prompted me to decide to make the same offer, as it were, to other radio stations in the area. That is, we'll give you permission to pick up our signal and uh, you can do that and rebroadcast it, thereby tripling, quadrupling the uh, explanation, uh, uh, you know, just expanding uh, uh, our coverage area. And we had in total 13 radio stations that agreed to do that. And so for a period of about two weeks at 15 minutes past the hour, we would uh, broadcast 
what we call the flood emergency network. Now, keep in mind that that was five minutes devoted to the flood information, which we were disseminating through civil defense. But through the rest of the hour, we were all doing our own thing and, uh, and broadcasting what information we could offer. I should point out to those of you who are watching and or listening that my home is very near Geisinger Medical Center, and we are on the flight path of all of the emergency helicopters coming in and out. And there goes one now, and boy, what a reminder of some of the sounds we heard during Agnes. Helicopters were vital uh, during the Agnes uh, emergency. It was very important that civil defense deal with rumor control. Fake news, I suppose, started during, uh, to some extent, during Tropical Storm Agnes. Uh, one of the local radio stations had a call from some individual who believed that uh, the levee system had been breached in his community. Now, what had happened was the river was high and high enough in that area where some waves were coming over the top of the levee. The listener regarded that as a breach of the levee, called that radio station, and that radio station reported that alleged breach. Well, it was not in fact a breach. It was a, a phenomena caused by the high water and the waves and the wind. Now that kind of information going out to some people it can be very disconcerting and might force a, a panic situation. Very, very dangerous in any kind of an emergency. And that's why this radio network that was formed was crucial in terms of getting out, if you will, approved, verified information. And in fact, it, it was able to do that. And you knew as a listener, certainly during that network broadcast that you were getting verified factual information. Unfortunately, that information was coming directly from civil defense and its headquarters, which was built in terms of dealing with the Cold War and the worries of the Cold War. It was a nuclear attack rather than a, a flood or tornado emergency that uh, sort of was the uh, the terror that, if you will, was in the back of people's minds. So Luzerne County Civil Defense was set up in the sub-basement. Understand not the basement, but the sub-basement of the Luzerne County Courthouse, which was located immediately next to the Susquehanna River. And so at one point during one of my broadcasts, the drain in the floor of that room where my two-way radio was set up became a small fountain. And it was at that point when I alerted General Townend to that, uh, that flow of water into the room that uh, the decision was made we were going to have to move civil defense, initially upstairs, uh, but uh, eventually to another building out of the area completely. We were getting information since all phones in the community were basically out by way of uh, ham radio operators, uh, even citizen band radio operators, certainly through the National Guard and through state police sources. Those were the sources that enabled us in civil defense to verify reports that we had. Well, low lying areas of our community had actually been evacuated that day, the evening before in some cases. But there was still a feeling that we could head off an actual major flood, even though we were seeing water coming into the sub-basement of the courthouse. Some people have suggested that at that point, a total evacuation should have been ordered. I would differ from that opinion based on my recollection of what the civil defense officers were telling us. And that was that the reading levels upstream were still within bounds. We could gauge what would happen in our area if we knew 
what was happening upstream. And so rather than evacuate on the 22nd, we called for thousands of sandbaggers to come and begin sandbagging the levee system, basically in the Wilkesbury Kingston area. And the next morning, that is the morning of the 23rd, we had thousands and thousands of volunteers filling sandbags and putting them on the top of the levee system. Uh, most of those people were college students, but not all. There were other people that were there as well. And it was a last ditch effort to try to head off the flood. Now, in the meantime, we, we lost radio stations, uh, including my radio station, the, the one that was from which the, the broadcast went emanating. Uh, and we had to switch to other stations to be the main source for our network. Since telephones were out, we depended on an army field telephone. You've seen them in movies. Uh, an officer on one end picks up the phone, winds a, a, a electrical switch and sends the signal to by wire to another phone. We had uh, set up the broadcast from uh, an FM station that was active in our area at that time, WYZZ. And it became the uh, prime station to feed information. Ironically, we lost only one broadcast on that emergency network. And that happened when two kids uh, walking uh, in the Heights section of Wilkesbury saw our wire and decided to play jump rope and used our wire as their jump rope. That broke the wire. We lost only one broadcast. The RME was quickly able to uh, track down the break and repair it. And uh, we were able to continue broadcasting. Additionally, another radio station on our network, uh, WSCR in Scranton, sent a vehicle to us with a two-way radio. So we actually were broadcasting at that point through two sources uh, on, uh, on our radio network. Pardon me. <clears throat> Back at the headquarters, uh, the sandbaggers were sort of making uh, an impact. We were staying slightly ahead of the river. I went outside to do one of... Uh, my reports to WILK, and much to my amazement at that very moment, I heard a little bit of noise above the roar of the flood. Not very much noise though, because the water was so loud. What I saw was what we called the North Street Bridge disintegrating. The water had already covered the road surface. Obviously the bridges were not in use because it would only be a a journey into floodwaters, and uh, the bridge broke apart. Uh, it, uh, if you lived on in the Kingston side of the river, it was called the Pier Street Bridge. If you lived on Wilkesbury's uh, side, it was the uh, the North Street Bridge. It has been replaced by what we now call the Veterans Bridge. But it was before the evacuation, and such a dramatic scene a dramatic realization of the power of the water that we were facing uh, from the high uh, volume you know, coming through from, from Agnes. And I know I had heard Mike at the beginning of the broadcast, even before I was able to join in, talk about saturated ground. You know, in a sense, the Agnes disaster happened for us or started for us, if you will, in April, because we had heavy rain in April and we had heavy rain in May. And so Agnes, even beyond topping the levees, would have been a major problem in many low-lying areas because we had saturated ground throughout Wyoming Valley. Well, uh, as, uh, as the decision was made to leave the sub-basement and at least go upstairs temporarily, uh, then County Commissioner Ethel Price asked me if I would help her carry some boxes of records 
upstairs. And I did. I grabbed some some records. So there we were, a young newsman and a veteran county commissioner uh, evacuating our sub-basement headquarters, but taking boxes of paper records upstairs. I really didn't have much realization as to what I was doing until Commissioner Price mentioned to me that some of those boxes contained records signed by Benjamin Franklin, who, of course, at one time was the treasurer in Pennsylvania and uh, had to sign documents that uh, ended up uh, in Luzerne County's archives because they were Luzerne County-based documents. And so there's a little side trivia of, of history that uh, we may have saved some, uh, some records uh, signed by Ben Franklin. In any case, moving upstairs was only a temporary measure. There was a realization that uh, whether or not the sub-basement became filled with water, the courthouse was going to be surrounded by water. And we couldn't uh, put all of our people in jeopardy. And so we moved our base of operations to the Wilkesbury School District Administration Building, which was, uh, oh, about a mile away logistically, but... Uh, on much higher ground. From there, we continued our emergency broadcasts. And of course, uh, the county was able to get information by way of those uh, ham radio operators and uh, citizens band and, and all of the official uh, sources that were giving us uh, data. I wound up sleeping at that uh, school district administration building for uh, three days. I had called my wife during the beginning of, uh, on the 22nd, telling her there was an emergency brewing and uh, I'd be home a little late. Well, a little late turned out to be three days later in my case, and only for a few minutes then. And then I went back to uh, the civil defense headquarters. And many more people spent a lot more time than that uh, at that headquarters or doing flood emergency work. Uh, Interestingly enough, uh, one of our volunteers on that flood emergency network, a uh, television broadcaster named Mike Stevens, very popular in our area, came in to do one shift one evening. And of course, uh, the area was under virtually under martial law. We had uh, National Guardsmen that were stationed throughout to prevent looting and such. One of those Guardsmen was, uh, in effect, uh, a security for our civil defense headquarters and uh, didn't recognize Mike. Mike was strictly on radio at the time, not television. And uh, this armed guard confronts Mike and said, you know, you, you can't go in, that's the civil defense headquarters. And Mike said, that's where we're doing our broadcast from. Well, the, the guardsman was pretty uh, strict saying, no, I, I can't let anybody in. And at which time Mike actually passed him and said, if you have to shoot me, do, but I'm going in to do my shift and Mike, Mike took his shift on that network. Uh, that's a you know, humorous recollection. And yet at the same time, it is demonstrative of the dedication uh, of the people who were manning my network. And those people were made up of volunteers from all 13 of those radio stations that were participating. Some were news people, some were disc jockeys, uh, you know, perhaps even salesmen that were taking a shift on the network. And we took a lot of liberties on that network. Under FCC regulations, you are not supposed to give personal messages on a commercial broadcast. That's why when uh, you used to see some of the TV shows and someone would come up to uh, the host of a, a game show and say, gee, can I say hello to, to Myrtle? Uh, he would say, no, you can't do that. Of course, they had already done it by asking. But we actually went so far as to broadcast uh, information such as Joe Smith is, uh, is at the Wilkesbury Scranton International Airport. We know that Joe's wife is on the west side of the river and has been unable to contact him. Joe is safe and uh, handling the responsibilities uh, for which he's been assigned. So things like that that, again, seem trivial. And yet you can imagine how important they were to people. I mean, my wife could hear me on the air. She knew where I was, but so many people didn't know where their loved ones might be. And they were separated by a river, which was now a mile wide. 
uh, th this was this was an important element, not only of rumor control, but of making personal contacts. Now, with regard to people's view as to what uh, they were facing, they were, of course, they were uh, upset and annoyed. They evacuated to shelters, they evacuated to uh, relatives' homes, things like that. But when the waters started to recede, a decision was made to have news people go back into the area first. We were on army deuce and a half, so those are big trucks that you, you see pictured in the movies. And we were, we were given instructions, we were given a suggestion by civil defense, by General Townend, who basically said, people have no idea what they're going to face when they go back into their home areas. Please, those of you in the news media, paint a word picture for them so that they have some preparedness to, if you will, lessen the shock just a little bit as to what they were going to see, what they were going to find. And of course, there were homes off foundations, there were roofs of homes that were now tilted to one side. Uh, there was mud everywhere, uh, first and second floor height in some areas, a terrible, terrible stench in the area as uh, uh, river smell, you know, mixed with, uh, with odor from sewage, from uh, things that, I mean, keep in mind you had oil tanks and probably even some gasoline tanks that were breached, that were mixing with the river water. And uh, so the, the, the stench was actually uh, as, as vivid a reminder of uh, the damage as was the, the homes uh, that you could see tilted and, and, and wrecked. Um, we did that. And the general consensus was that it was very helpful in having people better prepared to face what they had to face. Uh, our network was up for about two weeks, roughly. And we had all those volunteers helping out all that time. People had to be rescued, um, obviously uh, not far from our civil defense temporary headquarters, there was a steep street that became a boat launch from which uh, volunteers uh, gave their motor boats, lent their motor boats to uh, rescue workers. And when I look back, one of the things that amazes me is the fact that our area, Wyoming Valley, was hardest hit. Now, now obviously, Agnes did damage from Florida to New York State. But our area was hardest hit of the $2.3 billion estimated damage at that time, 1 billion was in Wyoming Valley. And yet we lost approximately three lives and two of those were rescue workers. I believe that one of the others may have been someone that couldn't get away from the sandbagging efforts quite fast enough. That loss of life, any loss of life being unacceptable, but that numerical loss of life in an area so affected, I think is phenomenal. And I think speaks well to the job that emergency workers and especially those of us in communications were able to do uh, during this emergency. I probably passed over a, a hundred things that I should have said and things may come to mind as questions or, or mic or someone prompts me. Uh, one thing, two, I guess, that I would tell anyone in terms of a flood emergency in our area, and there have been several threats since Agnes, and I tell them two things. Number one, if you are told to evacuate, please do so. You may have tremendous confidence that you're going to be safe, but the fact of the matter is, if you're not, someone's going to come out to try to save you. And that person is going to put their life in harm's way. And remember, two of those who died during Agnes in our area were rescue workers. 
The other thing I tell people is when you're told to leave, obviously get out as quickly as you can. But if you have the forethought, if you have the, uh, the thinking ability, and if the things are close enough, grab some of your personal things like wedding albums. Because the one thing I heard constantly after Agnes, I still hear it today. I rebuilt my home. My family was safe. I lost my wedding album. I lost my family pictures. I lost that photo of grandma and grandpa. Irreplaceable treasures. And here again, it's something you don't think of in advance. And so I, I try to tell people, you know, keep them handy. Keep them where you can see them and grab them quickly. That may seem small, but in retrospect, looking back, uh, uh, people wish they had those things. Now, with that, let me turn it over to you folks to see what you'd like to do in terms of questions or reminding me of what I've forgotten. Thank you so much, David, for that um, recounting of your story. Very much appreciated. So now I did want to turn it over for questions um, to our audience. And um, I don't know, Mike, if you have anything to start with, but um, I would just ask when you're asking a question to introduce yourself and perhaps what um, organization you're from or from the public. Um, so uh, do we have any questions here on the line? You can just uh, unmute yourself. Mike, I see you have something. I want to make sure we have enough time for ever, you know, I've, I've had plenty of time to talk to Dave DeCosmo uh, and ask all the questions I've ever wanted to ask. So I want to make sure. Um, yep. So I, you can, if you have a question, you can raise your hand using the um, function. I think there's a hand raise function, or you can just unmute and go ahead, or you can also add a question to the chat and I can um, ask on your behalf. I usually cover things so very thoroughly that questions aren't needed, but I, I do occasionally miss something. Uh. Well, I have a question, um, just David, for you. Um, so this, you know, the the kind of title of this presentation and just in general of, of the Silver Jackets um, efforts in, in this anniversary um, event um, is, you know, looking to the past, but also preparing for the future. So given all the lessons learned and, and what you saw in terms of communication, and obviously we've made a lot of advances in emergency management and comms and technology, I think we can all agree that um, we still learned, um, we still can learn a lot from, from your experience um, 50 years ago. So how do, you, how do you think you can apply your experiences or just you know, the, the experiences of the time um, to really shape, you know, still even after all this time, emergency management or perhaps you know mitigation uh, moving forward. Uh, how, sure. how would you? What What are some examples of of steps we can still take that that we still probably need to take or areas for improvement that we can still make even 50 years after Agnes? Yeah. Well, while communications have improved tremendously since 1972, I have a personal fear that a similar situation today would be very difficult to deal with in terms of getting information to the public. Now, let me explain why I say that. Deregulation has changed radio and television. First of all, television is impractical in terms of a media to keep feeding people who are having to evacuate or having to move from one place to another. Uh, during an emergency. Radio was the key during 1972. One, one of the publications said radio was the hero of the hour, and I truly believe it was. Those 13 radio stations that participated in my flood emergency network do not exist anymore. I'd venture to say that of all the people watching and listening today, you've probably lost local radio stations certainly AM radio stations. The stations that exist now are often owned by conglomerates that broadcast not locally, but via satellite to their frequency, their local frequency. And they are by and large incapable of addressing an emergency situation on a local and personal basis. If you have a 
disc jockey broadcasting by satellite from Seattle into an area like Wilkesbury, that disc jockey, even if he gets information, is limited in, to his knowledge as to say, you know, go to the airport. Well, we have two airports in our area. Uh, which airport do you go to? Um, cell phones are what we think are the logical answer. You can tell Joe that his, he's safe. He, Joe can call his wife now across the river and say, I'm safe, except if we lose cell phone communications. And that has happened. That's happened in regular storms. Imagine towers being flooded and cutting your grid, uh, cutting your, the amount of your network where you're able to, going to be able to broadcast. I have a tremendous concern. I think technology is at a state where it can broadcast specific and personal information like those radio stations did. It's set up to do that technically, but not realistically. I guess I'm envisioning someone at an emergency management headquarters who would have the ability to use his cell phone there to reach everybody in his area with an ongoing dialogue, handling rumor control, broadcasting personal information that's needed uh, for the good of everybody who's, who's uh, in harm's way during one of these emergencies. We've improved tremendously, but I think there's a gap and I think it's a crucial gap. It's a personal regional gap that still has to be filled. And I think yeah, David's right that radio communications is gonna be uh, quite important just given how unique of a communication uh, system and network it is and it is fairly durable. Um, we have here at Region 3, uh, a, pro a program manager who specifically focuses on disaster emergency communications, and that is all he does. And he prepares and works with the states to get these uh, all these various types of communications networks ready for the next one. Because we even saw during, uh, so the, the Weather Services River Forecast Center at the time was in Harrisburg, and right at the height of the flooding, they lost electricity and communications, right when their forecasts were needed most. Um, and, you know, today we work on things called continuity of operations. If, if we have a major system like that go down or a major way for us, we normally operate on, how do we then work on that? So that's one thing, just to let the folks know out there that uh, we do work, we do work a lot of that with the state and, and the locals as well. We're seeing a lot of folks in the chat, by the way, uh, Dave, who uh, are, are seconding your, your comment about photographs and how important it is and, and, um, and how that, you know, those are the type of things, you know, First and foremost, most importantly, get your uh, your family and your and your and your uh, pets and your loved ones out of the house, you know, into safety. But if you have that moment, um, if you are afforded that amount of time, uh, in some cases you are uh, before an evacuation. You know, these, these are the type of things you need to be looking at now. And and if you're unaware, we we already have these checklists that folks can use at ready.gov that help folks kind of you know right now we should be preparing for the next Agnes, you know. You may not have uh, a couple hours to evacuate. Sometimes, especially on the flash flooding side, you may only have uh, a couple minutes uh, because of the nature of, of rainfall and the science just isn't there to, to predict exactly where the rainfall is going to fall and exactly then what will happen flooding wise. It's, it's a little bit different than some of the other stuff the Weather Service predicts. So I want to make sure you know folks are doing that type of preparation um, and it's critically important. Uh, there are other folks on the line here. Uh, yeah, again, there uh, a lot of your fans from from uh, your your TV days are, are chiming in as well. So uh, I see Maggie Dunn, uh, who works with our mitigation uh, division and, and a big partner in this project. She has something she wants to say. Yeah, hi Dave. Um, you know, you're a wonderful storyteller, and I think we've all really enjoyed hearing the stories. And I think personal stories are one way to really keep this alive, but I guess my overall question is, how do we, you know, I work in mitigation. I'm trying to help people think about the long-term, a lot of the people on the call are as well. How do we keep the memory of Agnes alive um, such that we continue to learn from it so that we are taking the right precautions all the way from, all the way from the government level down to individuals? 
Well, obviously, during the 50th anniversary is very much alive. Uh, I've probably done interviews with 15 different outlets of, of one sort or another, radio, TV, newspaper. On the 23rd the anniversary, we got a documentary premiering at our local movie theater. Uh, it was sold out almost immediately, and they're going to have to do two more uh, attempts. Our local public uh, television station is doing something on the 23rd, another documentary. And it's easy to do when there's a, a, a an anniversary like this. On a daily basis, it's, uh, I guess, in a, in, a, in a sense, one of the best and most demonstrative reminders is at our amusement park, which is, uh, oh, an hour and we're in 15 minutes away from here, Canobles, no, no. a very popular amusement park. And uh, as you're walking between the carousel and the roller coasters and uh, the other rides, you'll see signs saying Agnes with a line showing that was the level of the flood. <clears throat> Pardon me. I think that uh, the reminders like that are actually, they're subtle, uh, but they work. But let's go beyond Agnes and get back to that communication thing that I'm very worried about. We had a tornado that came through our area here in Wyoming Valley about three years ago now, and it hit one of our shopping centers just after closing time. So it was uh, you know, probably uh, uh, nine o'clock at night, something like that. Now, the weather forecast, uh, the, the uh, NOAA, weather radio said there was a tornado reported in Wyoming Valley. So you, as a person living in the area, you as a person whose mom, whose dad went out to do some shopping, you're concerned. And so you rush to your local radio and you tune your dial, your AM dial, your FM dial. I can assure you that those who tuned found absolutely nothing about a tornado until about one hour later when our, our one local talk station, the uh, news director took it upon herself to come in and broadcast the information she was gathering. If you were a regular listener to that station, you didn't expect news at night. So you might not have even checked like I did. So here again, uh, Noah Weather, your, 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 Cell phone can give you an amber alert, but it can't tell you that Joe's safe over there or that damage was confined to such and such. You have to wait for a later TV broadcast to get that information. What I'm saying is we need a way to use the technology we have to get through to people as quickly as possible with rumor controlled information. And remember, when I walked into civil defense that morning of June 22nd, 1972, I walked in to give reports to my station by way of a two-way radio. I was drafted as the civil defense public information officer because the person who had volunteered for that position was unable or unwilling to come in. So all of you FEMA outfits, all of the local agencies, make sure you have someone assigned to public information, someone that you can depend on being there and doing the job, because it is absolutely crucial. Thanks, David. Um, so I just wanted to mention we are at our hour mark, but we have a couple more questions in the chat. David, are you available to answer some more questions? Absolutely. Great. So um, for those of you who can't stay on. Um, I just wanted to answer a question in the chat. This webinar will be available on the Silver Jackets website, which I posted the link to again. Um, so David will stay on the line for a couple more minutes here. I think we have one or two more questions to ask from the chat. Um, and then uh, also here on the screen, wanted to tease um, a video that FEMA Region 3 has um, created focused on David um, that will be available also on the website here in the next day or so. And I believe um, if we're able to, we will share that video um, uh, at the end of the webinar as well. Um, so stay tuned for that or, or check it out on the website. But 
Um, going to, back to questions for um, David here from Michelle French um, asks, since the news media went in first to see the disaster before the community, did you have any angry citizens who were upset they didn't see the damage first? And if so, how did you deal with them? If there was anyone upset by being, uh, and, and there were a lot of people that were anxious to get back in, uh, but it was just plain off limits and that was for safety's sake. Um, so it was an anger. They just had to bear with, um, our, our tour through the area was a very, uh, swift tour. And we took maybe an hour to drive through the area. And it was probably the next day when people were actually allowed back in. Um, we didn't hear from people about their anger. I think people were more in shock from the amount of the damage they saw. And again, our being able to give them a little forewarning of that damage probably lessened some of the grief, if nothing else. Great, thank you. Um, so does anybody, I think that's the final question in the chat. We have a lot of great comments um, about, you know, everything you've been talking about, David. So um, I would encourage everyone to read through those, but um, does anybody else have any questions here? And Kasha, one thing real quick with the uh, with David's the video that we're doing with featuring David. We actually have another one featuring another uh, someone who lived in Swordsville. Uh, we actually already dropped that video, but we're going to probably be circ circling that again. Uh, there's a couple of videos. Plus, the Army Corps of Engineers has done some great videos. Uh, the Weather Service has been putting out some great videos as well. A lot of that stuff's getting sourced uh, to the website, but you keep an eye out for that on the various social media feeds. Um, and anybody, you know, please help share it. You know, again, there's only so much we could do on our end to get that to get that message out. People listen to you. You know, they listen to your own little networks, and that's how we. That's how the story spreads. That's how the oral history keeps alive. So uh, definitely, uh, you know, press that little share button whenever you see some of this stuff come through. And there's some great content. If you see Agnes fifty hashtag Agnes fifty is if you're on a, a couple of the uh, various platforms that use hashtags that's one way to find it but um you know there's some great works being done there in that multi-agency group called silver jackets you know it's both federal state and uh local as well as you know non-government agencies like some of the river basin commissions and such so uh anyhow uh and there's a we are, we are doing a facebook live panel tonight uh so uh, keep an eye out for that if you go to the middle atlantic river forecast center's facebook page uh there, there should be a link there um but there'll be a facebook live tonight that's an hour and a half um, so come and come check that out. We'll be talking about some other stuff, but I mean, it, I, I'm just amazed. Like I forgot that you started on June 22nd, 1972. That's when you walked into the command center. That's tomorrow. That's 50 years ago tomorrow. And to me that, uh, as a history, as a history, uh, student of history, uh, for my entire life, uh, that just, th that's pretty cool. So, uh, among all the other amazing things that you did, uh, during Agnes and since. One um, of the Mike. Oh, just quick question for Mike or David. Um, is there a Hurricane Agnes Museum? That's a question in the chat. I figured one of you would know that, if anybody. <laughs> there is, um, uh, there's one in, uh, I believe, uh, down toward the Sunbury area. One of the communities there has, has something. Um, there's no formal museum for it. And it, it, it's an interesting thing because as someone wrote, there is one in Johnstown. And uh, that may, uh, something like that may very well answer uh, your earlier uh, question or an earlier observation about uh, how to keep this thing alive on a, on a ever going basis. If there was some sort of a small museum, our, our uh, local historical society, I saw the director on television last night and he was able to recover from someone uh, a carton of what looks like beer but it was a brewery, I think Budweiser, that actually donated a bottled water to the area. And that's going to be an artifact that will be in the Luzerne County Historical Society Museum. But uh, the idea of having a central place, uh, uh, as small as it may be, with some artifacts and certainly video and pictures are readily available, not a bad idea at all, because it does, does keep things alive, as it were. And it's important to remember uh, you know, it's the old story. If, if you, you don't remember history, you're forced to repeat it. 
There's Thank Agnes, history, Agnes history all around us. One little tidbit is if you're on the National Mall down in Washington, D.C., there is a carousel there. And that carousel was at one of the amusement parks in Maryland that Agnes destroyed and the carousel was salvaged. So you could go ride, uh, you know, the courtesy of the National Park Service, you can go ride uh, a piece of Agnes history uh, for, uh, you know, down in the National Mall, public property and, and, and right at the heart of our nation's capital. So there's Agnes history all around us. The website does a great job of trying to, we've done a lot of mapping. So you get an idea like what happened in my town? Um, you know, I'm, I'm a storm weather historian. Of course, I would love a, a museum like the Johnstown Museum for Agnes. But, you know, it, it's it, you know, I think we're gonna have to rely predominantly on things like the documentaries, like uh, these oral histories are doing with with Dave DeCosmo on the historical societies in all the various counties. Dauphin County has a fantastic book out uh, that I've, I've sourced a lot of material from by Eric Fasick uh, down there in South Central PA. I know Cumberland County. Pennsylvania also has a lot of material right down there. And of course, up in the Wyoming Valley, those historical societies always connect with them and, and try to help you know, spread their efforts as well or spread their word and their, you know, get people to go into those historical societies to, spread, to, to learn more. Thank you, Mike. Um, and one question, um, is there or uh, should there be an effort to recruit private ham radio operators around the region to assist in disasters? So, um, yes. Yes. Go ahead. yes, unquestionably, yes. <clears throat> Pardon me, the, the uh, amateur radio operators were crucial, <clears throat> pardon me, during Agnes and uh, would be in any future emergency. So, uh, yeah, they're, they're vital, absolutely vital. Absolutely. In fact, they do have networks uh, for those who are HAM certified. Um, I'm blanking on there's two different there's two different organizations. Maybe someone want to throw them out in the uh, throw them out into the, the chat. Um, uh, you there and I again, apologize for blanking on the names, but there are networks that local emergency management agencies uh, race. Yes, Racy's Lori, thank you is one of them. I think there's another one as well. Um, it is you know ham radio operating. It's one of those you know things that you know isn't as popular with the younger generations these days. And it really, we really need to build up that next, uh, that, me that next cadre of ham radio operators. So if that's, you know, if you want to play a role in some of these disasters, that's one way you can, which you can do it. We have to learn a lot of the mechanics of, of operating radios, which, you know, does require you to pass an exam and whatnot, but look into it, look into it. So I see David A12. Uh, did you want to chime in real quick? Well, I, I think again, those, uh, those operators were crucial. Even Citizens Band, radio help during Agnes. Um, the more communication you have, the better. Communication is key to dealing with any emergency. And it has to be accurate. Again, rumor controlled information so people know they're getting, uh, let me go back to Jack Webb and Dragnet. Just the facts, ma'am. And I see we have a question from a David A12, or I'm assuming it might just be a different David. Uh, do you want, uh, you want to unmute real quick or I'm not sure if you're able to. You can or, also put your question in the chat. ARRL is another organization that assists with them. And, and funny enough, let me actually get back to the, uh, uh, the photo. If you saw the photo here, so we went down with Dave DeCosmo into the sub-basement of the of the uh, the courthouse, and he hadn't been in there for 49 years. Which, again, as a history person, you know that that gave me goosebumps. You know, just to be with someone who was in the room where it happened, and um, and it was a very. And this is where we filmed that. And what was interesting is this: if you see my mouse right here, this door was shut, and I had scouted out the the sub basement. Many thanks to the Luzerne County uh, Courthouse as well as Luzerne County Emergency Management helped us get get us down there. So many thanks to them. Um, but anyhow, I went to, that door was shut and I just didn't even notice it because we're trying to find a drain. You know, it, David had that, that story about the geyser that came up behind him. Um, and so we're trying to find it. And I thought we might have found it. But Dave's walking in. He's like, I don't think this is it. I don't think it. Then he walks over to this closed door and opens the door and then flips the light on. And it's a it's a storage. It's a cleaning closet. as You can see over here. And Dave turns around and he's like, that's where I was in this little room. Cause this whole sub basement down here, which was a command center down there today is just, you know, 
storage space. So that was really cool. Uh, so that over here, uh, where Dave is sitting, that's where he sat 50 years ago. But his radio is basically, we had another angle of the shot, basically where these paint drums are, uh, that are buckets, that's where his radio was. And the drain on the floor was right between Melissa and Amanda, right there. So that gives you an idea. So uh, that was pretty cool to be down in that space with him. And um, yet another part of history, but I just want to make sure for the radio, the ham, a lot of EOS, a lot of emergency operations centers today have a little side room that is for the volunteer ham radio operators. That's still, they, again, it's still something that's being used today. And again, I highly encourage folks to get involved with that. Um, do we get that question? No, not from uh, the other David. Um, I didn't see any questions come through. Um, so I don't see any additional questions. Um, Mike or Dave, would you have anything else you wanna mention here? Well, from, from my point of view, I just wanna thank everyone who's participated. I wanna thank FEMA for giving the attention to this storm that it really deserves, not only in terms of remembering, but in terms of learning and being ready for the next emergency, whatever it is, be it flood, be it tornado, be it straight line wind damage, uh, just the idea of we've got to learn. We've got to use the technology we've got today and redesign it to make it personal and regional because in the, the bottom line is this is going to save lives. That's the very, very bottom line. Homes can be replaced. Granted, those pictures cannot be replaced, but certainly lives cannot be replaced. And it's essential in any emergency that we are prepared in terms of communications to let people know what's happening, how they can respond, how they should respond, how to keep themselves safe. And I thank all of you that have been involved in this endeavor and uh, I, I think in the you know years ahead, when Dave DeCosmo, like Agnes, is a memory, that something will be in place to make sure people know what's happening, know what to do, and can be saved. Thank you it, so it, much, it, Mike. Yeah, I was about to say it is um, very difficult to to follow uh, Dave DeCosmo any sort of closing comments or anything because he is so good. You could tell that he was in media because he's incredibly eloquent and he is one of the best storytellers I've ever met. Um, and, and we are incredibly grateful and thankful for not only the time he's given us over the last uh, six months or so we've been working with him on this, uh, but just the, what he did 50 years ago. Uh, I cannot stress it enough. Thou, you know, he mentioned thousands of lives were saved in that room and a lot of that saving was done via communication to the people. And who was there manning that radio for three, four days was David DeCosmo. And so we are, uh, uh, I think, I, on behalf of the region, very thankful for your service um, and the work that you did in, in truly uh, a heroic situation, especially given that your life was in danger down there in that sub-basement with the, the, you know, the floodwaters and, the, and, and what could have happened down there uh, if you didn't have as much advance notice of things being really bad uh, in the sub-basement. So uh, the one thing um, to... To know uh, what's interesting is someone mentioned the get out you know, message. What's funny is that David is known for this uh, quote he had for get out now, get out now. You can actually hear it. Uh, there's a, if you go search a flood of memories, which is a WBRE documentary from it's on, it's on YouTube and their website from uh, about 30 years ago, you can hear him in the opening minute. That's Dave. I actually hear him in the credits too, when he's taught, telling them, passing the messages back and forth about from, from the loved ones. Uh, we also include some of that audio in the video that I mentioned before. So keep an ear out for that's Dave in that when you hear the get out now, get out now and you start talking about the evacuation, that is Dave DeCosmo 50 years ago. So keep keep an eye out for that. Um, it's It was just awesome being able to hear that and then talk to the same gentleman, you know, 50 years later. So thank you, sir, uh, for everything you've done. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. And, and again, help us spread the word on, on this type of messaging. And back to Akasha. Yep. So, oh, sorry, David, do you have something? Just wanted to say thank you again. Uh, it's been a pleasure to work with you and I think we've accomplished something. Great, thank you. And, and we do actually have, um, I believe uh, Jackie will be able to share the video um, that we've uh, developed here at FEMA Region 3 um, for our outro. So if you have some time, a couple of minutes to stay on to 
uh, watch the video. It'll also be available on, on the websites we mentioned earlier. Um, so Jackie, I don't know if you can share your screen. Um, and thank you again, everybody for joining and hope you enjoy this final video here. Hi, I can definitely share my screen and uh, just give me the thumbs up once everybody sees it. Oh, it, <laughs> I'm not sure it's going to allow me. It says uh, the host has to allow screen sharing. Okay, yeah, that's all right. So, okay, sorry about um, that. The, web, the video will be available on the Silver Jackets um, on YouTube and the website uh, later today or tomorrow. So hope you can all... Um, see that there. And once again, thank you so much, David and um, Mike, for your presentation and comments today. And have a good day, everybody.